my dad, with a funny ache in his voice, bought me a Bugatti. But get this, he says, in black. I wanted it in red. The girl on the screen, with a perfect waist, long wavy dark hair, looks out onto an endless glinting sea. That girl, you say to yourself, now she's got a body. Oh, I went to Spain on the weekend, but it was so hot I didn't even want to be there. He stood proudly at the end of the race, sweating and panting still and holding his medal close to his chest. 40k raised! Those children in Cambodia are lucky to have him, his other friend says. How stand up, you say. His friend snorts. You caught your friend's eye on the other side of the barricade, and they are made small as he smiles wide. You see a glint, and it reads maliciously, as if he is saying to you, What? Jealous? There are countless poems about love, war, beauty, loss, but I find that there are precious little poems, at least to my knowledge, that focus solely on the theme of jealousy. The absence of this poetic theme does not make sense to me. Jealousy is a feeling as old as time. Jealousy makes Cain kill Abel. Jealousy makes Vishwa Mitra, Vedic Sage, covet Vashista's divine cow. Jealousy makes Athena turn Arachne into a spider. Jealousy makes you snatch a toy from another child in the sandbox. Jealousy makes you leave a mean comment on the internet. Well, hello there. This is Zurich, and right now we're up in the air, where we skydive into books, poetry, and anything else that looks good to get into. Now we're all acquainted, let's jump out of this plane with a dew. Let's go! Today, the poem Fable. The poem Fable by Thomas Bailey Aldrich expresses this evocation of jealousy through a simple allegorical narrative. Concentrating on the poetic structure and rhyming pattern, the poem Fable uses these structural elements to emphasize the metaphorical depiction of the jealous and the lesson Aldrich wishes to teach against acting on one's envy. Since the poem's quite short, I'll read it. No, 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 no need to thank me. I'm just doing my job. It begins like this. A certain bird in a certain wood, feeling the springtime warm and good, sang to it in melodious mood. On other neighbouring branches stood other birds who heard his song. Loudly he sang and clear and strong. Sweetly he sang, and it stirred their gall, there should be a voice so musical. They said to themselves, we must stop that bird, he's the sweetest voice was ever heard. That rich deep chest note, crystal clear, is a mortifying thing to hear. We have sharper beaks and hardier wings, yet we but croak, this fellow sings. So they planned and planned and killed the bird with the sweetest voice was ever heard. Simply, it's about a group of birds of prey, telling from their sharper beaks and hardier wings, killing the smaller songbird because of how jealous they are of how well he sings. The rhyming structure, with its sudden shift in rhyme whenever these other birds take note of the songbird, alludes to how these birds are malicious actors. Where the poem has a musicality to the rhyme, whenever the birds of prey are being mentioned or their thoughts are being expressed, it is in fact jealous feelings ringing true. This is in contrast to the sonic disruption seen through the change in rhyme, as though a wrong chord had been struck against the envious birds, found when the songbird and its talent is being addressed in the narrative. The rhyming scheme is A, A, B, A, C, C, D, D, E, E, F, F, G, G, E, E, it's notable how the rhyming scheme shifts when the songbird is doing something to be praised. All is fine when a certain bird in a certain wood, feeling the springtime warm and good, 
since just existing is not a worthy achievement. But the rhyme changes when he sings in melodious mood. The change in rhyme gives a feeling that the poem's perspective is against the talent of the songbird. You could argue that good and mood is a slant rhyme, which would betray the talent of the songbird as somehow bad, and it is in the perspective of the birds of prey. This reaction of displeasure is seen again, when the other birds who hear his song, and seeing how loudly he sang and clear and strong, have an abrupt change in the rhyme scheme from sonorous song strong to hard and guttural gall. It makes it feel that the gall all the birds feel against the songbird is deeply rooted and malicious. It would seem, by the sound of it, that the poem is endorsing being jealous about the achievements of others and acting on that jealousy in a way to harm others. But underneath the noise, the structure of the poem indicates the moral deviation of these other birds' thinking. The line structure is irregular, differing between eight syllables in a line used for when the songbird is being mentioned, e.g. that rich deep chest note crystal clear, and the odd or excessive number of syllables in the different lines when we hear of the other birds and gain insight into their perspective, e.g. other birds who heard his song, which is seven syllables. They said to themselves, we must stop that bird, which is ten syllables, and the most common variation, the nine syllable line, e.g. he's the sweetest voice was ever heard. It is clear that when looking at the poetic form, which you can reason as to being the heart of the poem, which all techniques and narrative is built on, the other birds are morally at odd with the message of the fable. It is telling when the only line that the other birds speak, which matches with the even syllabic form of the poem, is the line, Yet we but croak, this fellow sings. Only when recognising their own inadequacy in their talents when compared up against the songbird, whether that is in singing or in being more morally upstanding, are the other birds using the even syllabic form that the poem begins with. Perhaps this moral failing that the other birds show is not innate in that the songbird is actually better than them naturally, but in the way the other birds are unable to see their own talents, their sharper beaks and hardier wings, and in doing so rejecting what could be a positive for them, instead sees themselves deficient. It should be noted that killing the songbird did nothing for the other birds. The poem finishes on the legacy of the songbird, not the relief of the other birds of prey. It suggests, as fables do, a moral, that is, acting on jealousy often does not help the situation, in fact, it only makes the other person more significant to others as a victim of your actions. In the end, the other birds get so worked up about their own perceived deficiency that they destroy the object of their envy and all the good it had. The loss of a common good in the world and the corrupted actions of the birds of prey is made final when the concluding nine-syllable line is stated in the past tense and the superlative is used. They kill the bird with the sweetest voice was ever heard. And the moral is, before you decide to crush those who you think are better than you, or envy them for what they have, think about what good you can do, and also what the world will miss if you bring down something that was thriving and providing good to others. Thank you so much for listening. Hopefully you enjoyed it. And if you did, please use your talons to pierce the flesh of the like button to then feed it to your young. Subscribe if you want to see more videos that take a deep look into books and poetry and tries to explain their significance in a way that's too highbrow and too lowbrow. Do you know any other poems about jealousy? It is so easy to get jealous, especially when on social media. Um, it is hard not to be jealous sometimes. What are some of your ways to avoid a jealous spiral? <laughs> this and anything else, leave a comment down below. Otherwise, I'll see you in the next one. Ciao.